Hello and welcome to Eye on Africa for your daily roundup from across the continent. Coming up on the show, United States Special Forces have confirmed the killing of Islamic State group Bilal al-Sudani in Somalia on Wednesday. Sudani, a key financial facilitator for the terrorist organization, was targeted in the northern mountains of the country. We speak directly with the Pentagon to explore the significance of Sudani's killing. And then with anti-France feelings running high in Mali, the UN Security Council has met to discuss the ongoing situation in the country. Several nations have expressed their concern over Mali's transitional authorities who have also interfered with the local UN peacekeeping mission. And as leaders of Ethiopia and Sudan look to rekindle ties in Khartoum, there's a small matter of the multi-billion dollar Renaissance Dam to discuss. The meeting also comes as Sudanese authorities take part in wrangling peace talks seeking to end more than a year of military rule. Thanks for joining us. A U.S. military raid in Somalia ordered by President Joe Biden on Wednesday killed the regional leader of the Islamic State group Bilal al-Sudani. Sudani was killed during a gunfight after U.S. troops descended on a mountainous cave complex in northern Somalia. Around 10 of Sudanese IS associates at the scene were also killed. Uh, to discuss the operation further, I now have the pleasure of being joined by Pentagon Deputy Press Secretary Ms. Sabrina Singh. Ms. Singh, thank you so much for joining us. I just want to talk about Sudanese importance. Why did the U.S. Uh, put him as such a high-profile person uh, in this operation? Thank you for having me today. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. Um, as you had mentioned at the top of your program, Bilal al-Sudani was an ISIS leader operating within Somalia, and his presence was known to the U.S. government uh, for, for many years. The Treasury Department in 2012 had designated him as a terrorist. Um, this is someone who had been financing uh, uh, foreign uh, travelers, to an al-Shabaab training camp when he was with al-Shabaab and then later moved on um, to operating within ISIS. And he was responsible for funding the group's operations worldwide, including in Afghanistan. And so the U.S. military, uh, under the orders of President Biden, conducted a successful operation um, that killed al-Sudani yesterday in, in the mountains of, of Somalia, as you mentioned. And I think what's important here is that this operation should really send a message to those who support ISIS around the world, that there is no geography too remote for the United States to find those um, who are conducting or pose threats to the United States and our, our partners and allies around the world, um, we will hold them accountable. Uh, you mentioned there, Ms. Singh, about the fact that you found uh, al-Sudani while he was still a member of al-Shabaab. Now, obviously, the role of Islamic State in Somalia, uh, this is what we are focusing on now. Uh, what, is the, what is the presence like of Islamic State there, given the continued uh, presence of al-Shabaab in Somalia? Yes, that's correct. Al-Sudani was previously a member of al-Shabaab and then became a leader uh, within ISIS. We're, we're continuing to see ISIS grow uh, its presence throughout Somalia and uh, throughout Africa. We, are, we know that they are dedicated to recruiting and expanding their networks, and that's why the U.S. is one of several countries providing support to the federal government of Somalia in its ongoing efforts to disrupt, degrade, and defeat terrorist groups. We know that rooting out extremism ultimately requires intervention beyond just traditional means. And so the U.S. is partnering um, with, with the Somali government to promote stabilization and economic development. Again, Somalia remains a, a central country to peace and stability in, in East Africa. And as you are probably aware, we have our U.S. Africa Command um, stationed there that will continue to train, advise, and equip uh, Somali partner forces to give them the tools that they need, not only just to defeat al-Shabaab, but ISIS as well. And you're talking about the uh, importance of Somalia to the United States. Uh, of course, airstrikes and uh, targeted uh, attacks 
on Somalia by U.S. forces, that dropped significantly in 2022. We only saw about 16 uh, back then, but now we've had these recent operations, firstly with uh, uh, al-Sudani and before that with 30 militants being killed. Will 2023 be a year where the United States puts Somalia back on the table? Well, you're seeing a, a an effort by this administration, by President Biden, um, when he signed an authorization uh, in 2022 to once again put our military forces uh, inside Somalia. This was a decision that reversed um, an order by the previous administration, um, and, and instead of rotating our troops out, our intent is to maximize safety and effectiveness of our forces being there in the country of Somalia. And so um, you're seeing this as a, a focus of this administration. We are prioritizing um, efforts, uh, counterterrorism efforts, and that's what you've seen with some of the strikes that you had mentioned uh, just before. Of you're, you are going to see an uptick in what we are doing uh, to combat counterterrorism in Somalia and elsewhere around the world. Thank you so much. That is uh, Pentagon Deputy Press Secretary uh, Sabrina Singh reporting from, well, coming to us from uh, the Pentagon Live. The United States Nations uh, Security Council met on Friday in Mali to discuss uh, its ongoing peacekeeping mission in the country. Uh, several nations have expressed their concern about the country's transitional authorities and their interference with the UN mission. Here's uh, Jessica Le Massureur with an update from outside the UN Security Council headquarters in New York. The UN mission in Mali is overstretched and it's facing a highly volatile security situation. It can't effectively fulfil its mandate. That was made very clear during Friday's Security Council meeting to discuss the difficulties that the mission known as MINUSMA is facing and what should be done about them. Now, Council members discussed two reports. Both of them con conclude that given the current context in Mali, business as usual is just not possible. The report reveals how the relationship between the UN mission and the Malian government which is led by interim president Colonel Asimi Goita, who seized power in a coup back in May 2021, has become increasingly fraught, with the government often obstructing MINUSMA's efforts. Now, France pulled its troops out of Mali last year, and other troop-contributing countries have followed suit. And this has left the UN mission in a tight spot. It no longer has help from French troops and other troops, and it has to deal with the Malian public's rage that the UN mission failing to keep them safe. Now, MINUSMA was not actually designed to carry out counter-terrorism work, but rather to help protect civilians, yet it no longer has the support it needs to fulfil this mission. Now, peacekeepers are finding themselves facing unbearable risks as they themselves are targeted by extremist militias. Mali's decision to partner with Russian security company, the Wagner Group, has only made things worse for the UN. Uh, the Russian ambassador praised the junta's fight against terrorism and said that the hasty withdrawal of French troops had left a vacuum, but that is absolute disinformation as Mali requested that the French leave. Now, disinformation largely driven by Russia has been a huge problem for MINUSMA and for the UN. Mali's foreign minister attended this meeting on Friday and he criticised these reports. He said that it was up to Mali to decide who it partners with and that Mali does not need to justify its cooperation with Russia. Well, there was a very awkward moment when Mali's foreign minister spoke in a very disparaging way about uh, civil society activist Moon Awata Toure, who addressed the council during this meeting to talk about the plight of civilians in Mali. What was clear from this meeting is that Mali's interim government does not plan to make things easy for the United Nations mission there. Essentially, there are three options now for the future of this mission. Expand the force, limit its duties, or turn it into a political mission. The mission's mandate is up for renewal in June. Uh, that United Nations Security Council meeting in New York. In Khartoum on Thursday, Ethiopia's Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed held talks with various Sudanese leaders, including ruling general Abdel Fattah al burhan as both African neighbours look to rekindle ties. Among the key discussion topics was the Renaissance Dam, a multi-billion dollar project on the border, which Ethiopia says it needs to supply millions of its citizens with electricity. Sudan and Egypt, though, fear it will reduce the amount of water they receive from the Nile. Our regional correspondent Vivian Wandera explains. 
According to Sudan's ruling sovereign council, Burhan and Ethiopia's Abi Ahmed met on Thursday in Khartoum and held talks on way to improve bilateral relations. The council also stated that the two leaders are aligned and in agreement over the highly controversial Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Tensions have been high between Ethiopia, Egypt and Sudan since the beginning of the construction of the dam in 2011. While Egypt depends on the Nile for irrigation and drinking water, Sudan hopes that it will help generate electricity for them and counter annual flooding, but has raised fears that it might affect its own dam's waters if there is no agreement in place on ways to operate the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Both Egypt and Sudan started holding joint military drills dubbed Guardians of the Nile in 2021 in a, mean, in a way to boost military operations between the two countries. Despite this, Ethiopia insists that the project is indispensable to its development and will not affect Egypt's or Sudan's waters. Ethiopia's decisions to fill the dam's reservoirs in 2020 was met with condemnations from both Egypt and Sudan. Despite the condemnation, Addis decided to go ahead and start generating electricity from the dam in February of 2022. The European Union announced on Friday it would invest more than 280 million euros in grants to help South Africa move its energy dependence away from coal. Part of the EU fund will go towards the greening of municipal services and help repurpose coal power plants. It comes on the same day that US Treasury Chief Janet Yellen was in South Africa announcing a $1 billion contribution from Washington dubbed uh, the Just Energy Transition Partnership. Uh, this is what she had to say. An energy transition that is not just will simply not work. Equally important, however, it's imperative to seize the new opportunities that the transition will offer. The success of the JetP will not be possible unless we support the coal miners and coal mining communities as they transition to new economic activities. And finally, in one of the most beautiful scenes that Mother Nature has to show us, the Sahara in Algeria is experiencing snowfall over its sand dunes. This is the second year in a row the phenomenon has occurred with breathtaking sights, giving the desert a majestic white appearance like a bride's dress. Desert snow in Algeria has been recorded several times since 2005 when temperatures of negative 14 degrees Celsius were recorded in the Sahara during the Northern Hemisphere winter really puts a lovely sheen on the desert sand. Well, that's all the news we have from across Africa this evening, but there's plenty coming up on France 24, so don't go anywhere. From me, though, it's bye for now. Politicians picking their constituents. In the United States, the practice of redistricting favors the party in power. We take you to Ohio, where Republicans use and abuse the system. If we saw this in another country, we would un understand it as an attack on democracy. But because it's America and we're so proud of our democracy, we don't see it that way. It's called gerrymandering, an abusive practice for some, a political tradition for others. We have had gerrymandering ever since we have had a constitutional republic. It's not confined to one party or the other. Ohio, democracy in peril in Reporters on France 24 and France24.com.